Okay, well, I'll get started with my remarks, I guess. Um, and then, um, yeah, we're up to about 80 people. So wow, like, thank you so much, everyone for coming tonight. That is amazing. Um, my name is Jessica Robinson. Um, I'm an adult services librarian with Heights Libraries. Um, we are so glad that all of you took time out of your evening to join this program tonight. Uh, we also hope that you check out our many other programs that we're offering this spring. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup. Um, as many of you know, um, a lot of our spring uh, programs are centered around uh, themes of uh, local history and preservation. Um, and also uh, the very exciting upcoming centennial celebration for the city of Cleveland Heights. Uh, these programs are a joint effort that arise from many partner organizations, including the city of Cleveland Heights, Heights Libraries, the Cleveland Heights Historical Society, the Cleveland Restoration Society, um, the Cleveland Heights City Planning Department. Um, so there's many, many people who are involved in bringing these programs uh, to fruition. Um, I am going to put my name and information down in the chat there. Um, like I said, I'm Jessica Robinson. Um, and if you would like, um, my email is down below. If you have any questions or any, um, anything comes up that you'd like to contact me about, um, my email is localhistory at heightslibrary.org. Um, and this program is being recorded and will be available on the Cleveland Heights Historical YouTube channel. Uh, down in the chat box, you will also find all the spring program series dates and times, so please check those out. Um, you don't actually have to register for the programs. Um, the Zoom information, uh, like the Zoom, uh, yeah, the Zoom information is uh, down there with the programs. Um, and you can also find that information at heightslibrary.org. Um, just a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. Um, I'm just going to ask that everyone uh, keep their audio and video on mute for the duration of the program. Uh, because we are recording this. Um, there will be a time at the end of the program for questions. Um, so we ask that you share your questions for this program, like just put them into the chat box, and then I, um, I'll ask the uh, questions, I'll, I'll like, direct the questions to the speaker at the end of the program. Um, I'll also watch the chat box during the preservation, so if you, presentation, sorry. So if you have any questions or anything comes up, um, please just ask in the chat box and I'll do my best to uh, address any kind of questions or issues that may arise. Um, okay, wow, we are up to 93, goodness, and there's still people coming. Okay, um, but I am gonna turn this program over. Um, I wanna introduce our presenters. Friends of Bradford Cinderpath are residents collaborating with the city of Cleveland Heights and neighbors to improve the habitat and pedestrian experience of this unique well-traveled path. This talk is presented by John Barber and Peggy Spaeth a 40 year traveler of the Bradford Cinder Path. All righty, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. So I'm gonna put myself on mute and then turn it over to John and Peggy. I cut. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. I was just okay. going to say no so much. technology always. Yeah. So um, I'm going to um, take care of like if anybody is um, uh, unmuted or anything, I'll take care of that during the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Jessica, thank you for inviting us to give this talk and to Maisie Adams as well from the Landmark Commission. I'm Peggy Spaeth and this is my partner, John Barber. And um, we're coming to you from Bradford Road in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. It's so exciting to see so many friends and neighbors on this talk, and I'm sure you're all as curious as we were about the history of the Bradford Cinder Path. So we're just going to um, take you for a walk. Oops, I'll go now. So as most of you know, because you're probably all local, uh, the Bradford Cinder Path is a third mile long. It's this orange line right here, and it connects to um, roads. Bradford Road that goes from uh, Lee Road to South Taylor, and then the section of Bradford Road that goes from Canterbury to Edgerton. 
And one of the sections from Kingston to Edgerton was originally named Randolph Road, but it was changed to Bradford in 1926 because there was another Cleveland Heights Randolph Road and they decided to just keep the Bradford Road continuing. So before European settlement, 95% of Ohio was forested, including our area. And one of the very interesting things, uh, this map is from 1858. One of the very interesting things about it is if you look at the bright red lines on the map, that's the approximate location of the Bradford, uh, the two sections of Bradford Road. Uh, but in 1858, it was pasture and meadowland, farms, uh, and some woods left. And one of the things that we found so interesting in our research is if we um, superimposed today's roads onto uh, this map from about 1858, the Cleveland Historic Maps uh, project, if we put today's roads on there, you see that some of the roads orient in the same direction as some of the early farmland. Uh, some of it was north-south, some of it was east-west in terms of the uh, linearity uh, of the farmland in this map. So in 1907, the area that includes the Bradford Cinder Path was part of Idlewood Village. In Idlewood Village, uh, now called University Heights, um, encompassed a larger geographical area than it does today because in 1914, uh, residents in the western area of University Heights petitioned to be annexed to Cleveland Heights. And Cleveland Heights agreed to do this and diminished the area of Idlewood Village or University Heights quite significantly. But before this, uh, uh, before this annex, annexation happened, um, people started laying out streets because from about 1920 to about 1937, there was a frenzy of development of streets, of houses, and that frenzy of development meant that a number of streets were laid out according to when the, arc, uh, when the agricultural lands were purchased. And so you can see on the left side of the screen, some of the streets run east-west and then they flip upside down and run north-south, and then they'll pick up again in other areas. And if you remember back to the original 1858 map, you may recognize that some of that is due to, uh, perhaps due to where those farmlands were. So in about 1921, the Cleveland High School Board started buying property for Canterbury School. So they, this orange section here is all of the little lots that were slated to be, be home, home lots, uh, residential lots, um, were, were purchased by the school board to, for, for Canterbury School. You can see that there were a couple of lots down here towards the bottom that already had structures on them that, that were already homes, but that they were torn down. And um, so all at around the same time when they were thinking of building a school, as you know, there was no Bradford Road to, um, to the west. So Cleveland Heights started to buy vacant lots along Queenston, Kingston, and Princeton in order to connect those two streets of Bradford, to have one through street Bradford Road so that they're, the kids wouldn't have such a long, you know, they wouldn't have to go a long right way around the block to get to school. And also for better access for, as they said, police and fire departments. So um, Marion Morton's done a lot of, re I hope you're here, Marion, a lot of research on, on this. And she, um, she told us more about this, about the, the uh, frenzy to purchase land and to build houses. And as you know, most of our houses around this area were built in the 20s. So the school was finally built in, there's some, a little bit of controversy whether it was built in 1927 or 1929, but as we know, Canterbury School is there. So 
you know, there Cleveland Heights was, and Cleveland Heights said, we're going to build a road. We're going to connect these two pieces of Bradford Road. And so they wanted to build a road, but guess what? The neighbors were going to be assessed for the cost of the road. So there was a city council meeting, a Cleveland Heights city council meeting, and April 17th, 1926, and the residents spoke out. So Mayor Kane asked for a report on the Bradford Road improvement. And at this time, he asked all of those in the audience who are interested in the Bradford Road improvement to please stand. Not surprisingly, about 35 people responded to Mayor Kane's request. Mayor Kane then asked them, oh, excuse me, I can't read this, it's under this, where I can get. Well, anyhow, he, he asked them to, to sit down. He'd be glad to hear from any of them who are either for or against the improvement. I'm Mr. Craig, a property owner, and I do not feel that Bradford Road was needed because it would probably only be used as a shortcut for trucks and deliveries. And I would prefer a six foot walk through instead of a street. This one? Mr. Uh, I'm Mr. Wilson. I have a corner lot with an assessment of $1,392 at 4.5% interest. I have talked with a great many of the property owners, and I cannot find any who felt that they would use this street, that they would prefer to use through streets like North Woodland, currently Fairmount Boulevard, and Scarborough Road. I would much prefer to see a six-foot walkthrough put there there would be a credit to the community rather than the proposed street. I think if a petition were circulated against the improvement, that from 70 to 80% of the owners would vote against the improvement. I'm Mrs. Hoff, and I signed a petition asking for the street a number of years ago, but I had no idea it would be such a hardship on the property owners. And while my own assessment isn't high, I do feel sorry for the owners of the corner lots. I'm in favor of just a walkthrough. Another lady in the audience said that it would be no hardship on the children, but it would be good for them to have the walk to school. <laughs> so Canterbury School was then built in about 1929. These pictures are from 1933. Um, I actually found this box of, um, what are they called, stereoscopes? I forget what they're called. In a, in a cabinet in Canterbury School when I was co-PTA president years and years ago. And I gave them to um, the historical society that digitalized them. And I just think that they're remarkable. And I wonder how many of these children actually survived that slide, but it must have been a fair amount because we have quite a healthy population today in Cleveland Heights. So at the end of this 1926 meeting, Mayor Kane stated that he'd been over the ground and he himself felt that perhaps a sidewalk through would be sufficient. So the whole controversy about building a road and assessing the neighbors, it was referred to a committee. Nine years later, and we can only assume that this committee met infrequently, in October 1939, 35, the WPA came to the rescue because it was the depression. They were putting men to work. And one of the WPA projects was grading and paving Bradford Road from Taylor Road to Kingston Road. So the feds were gonna pay for it. The neighbors wouldn't be assessed. It would be a free road. What's not to like? Federal dollars will pay for this road. But wait, January 20th, 1936, at a Cleveland Heights City Council meeting, Mayor Kane stated he understood a great many in the audience were present to protest the proposed WPA federally funded improvement of Bradford Road. Mrs. McBride, who owns property at the corner of Queenston and Randolph, stated she objected to the street because of the noise it would bring right under her bedroom windows and that her house would practically be on the street. Another lady living across from Mrs. McBride stated she objected because the headlights of all cars going east would shine directly into her house as there's a jog in the street at this point and the fact that it would be a stop street would increase the noise and the disturbance. 
This one's my favorite, guys. A lady owning property the third lot from the proposed street on Taylor Road stated she objected because it would be necessary to remove large, beautiful trees. Does this sound familiar? And that this really is the prettiest section of Taylor Road. And one of the things to, to emphasize in January of 1936, the depression was full on in the country. <clears throat> there were quite a few uh, mentions in city council minutes about how appointments for interviews at the county relief office for Cleveland Heights families totaled 279 by January 1936. And in addition, Cleveland Heights was allocating public money to purchase milk from Hillside Dairy over on Noble Road to be delivered to indigent families. And so the city was purchasing milk from a local dairy to help indigent families. Times were really tough. So then there was a second council meeting in 1936 and more neighbors spoke out against the federally funded WPA funded road. So Mayor Kane stated he'd come to the conclusion that if we put in a six foot sidewalk and perhaps some tree planting, that that would be ample for the present, but that he would not recommend any landscape work being done. And then Mr. Canfield, who was the city manager, he had speak, spoken with the WPA officials to see if the project could be transferred from building a road to building a pathway. And they agreed to that. So the city council uh, unanimously agreed to build a path, our beloved cinder path, instead of a, a road for automobiles. So that no road was to be built and the WPA completed our path in 1938. But what about that comment that Mayor Kane said about no landscaping was to be done? Hmm. Enter the Friends of the Bradford Cinder Path 83 years later. You know, many of us have been walking down that cinder path for decades, and it's a beautiful path, but we started to notice that, you know, sometimes the city didn't necessarily mow it, um, you know, in a timely way because they have like 400 acres of parks to mow. And what were these plants that are growing along? Are they native to, um, to Northeast Ohio, or are they some invasive shrubs? So some of, some of us um, who had the time and the energy and the curiosity to do something about this came together to form a group called the Friends of the Bradford Cinder Path. And we applied for a mini grant from Future Heights in 2020 to purchase plants and fencing to protect the plants from the deer and to restore those beautiful columns that we all know and love along the path. They're very iconic columns, and one of the reasons we started on this whole investigation of what is the history of the Bradford Cinder Path is like, where did, where did our Stonehenge come from? You know, why are these here and who built them? So there are a total of 14 columns that are from Queenston to Canterbury, and they're just simply interacted with in many levels. Um, you know, people draw on them, kids climb on them. They're just very um, indicative of our neighborhood. I'd say that they're probably one of the primary icons that we can all de define in our, in our neighborhood. But you'll notice um, these columns here are kind of tilted, which also led us to question like, well, how old are these? And are they gonna fall over and what do we need to do with them? So we um, invited, we, we connected with the city and we had the city manager, um, Susanna Nierman O'Neill came out to look and um, Joe McRae from the Department of Parks and Recreation came out to look and city forester, Dan Krisner came out to look and Andre Spencer came out to look. So city officials came out and we, we shined a light on the, the Bradford cinder path and we said, well, we have a few hundred dollars that we can put towards these columns. But Joe McRae de, um, of the Department of um, Parks and Rec said that he actually had a fund for preservation of historic um, infrastructure. And so we contracted with a well-known Cleveland Heights native who's a very well-regarded 
stonemason. Um, his name is Brian Wagner, and many of you probably have had your stone steps replaced by, rebuilt by him. And he came out and he looked at them, and what he, what he determined from his extensive knowledge was that these two um, stone columns here on the Queenston side, the first ones, if you're coming from Radford Road, um, likely were original to the WPA. And look how straight they are. And then contrast their stone with the ones right across the street from them on the other side of Queenston. And it, you can see that it's a very different kind of stone. So he postulated that the, the originals, two columns, were likely from the 1930s and that the rest of the 12 columns were likely from the 1960s or 70s. What kind of stone was that? In the Indian Creek sandstone. Yeah, he, he identified it as an Indian Creek sandstone that apparently is still widely available. So he touched up the original ones by resurfacing the tops, but he had to rebuild some of the newer ones and put it, he installed um, cement footings so that they would be properly seated. I think it's very striking that the original ones so, were so well built though. I mean, they really knew how to build things um, by hand and a lot of great stonework such as you'd see at Cane Park way back in the 30s. So one, lots of you might be asking, okay, so if no one installed landscaping on the cinder path, what are we removing and why are we removing it? Well, most of the vegetation along the cinder path uh, are ornamentals that were brought into the country in the early 1800s as ornamental hedges. And, you know, we've planted them. We've planted the central one here is privet. We've planted buckthorn. We've planted honeysuckle in our yards as hedges. Um, nothing eats them, so they're often looking perfect because these plants haven't co-evolved with our native flora and fauna. And a lot of these plants, even though they weren't planted along the cinder path, have just opportunistically grown up. And, um, you know, those of us who are interested in the environment and native habitat object to them because they could be replaced with native shrubs and other plants and trees that would be more beneficial to wildlife. So one of the first things that the Friends of Bradford Cinder Path did was we started working on the Princeton to Canterbury block at last June in 2020. And we removed, we started working along and we removed all this underbrush under this oak. And then we revealed this beautiful root flare of this oak, which we, we measured the girth of the oak and used some magical calculations, which you can find online. And we determined that this red oak is actually about 230 years old. So that it may have been, you know, along a farm boundary and was left um, or a shade for cattle or whatever. It's a pretty old oak and it's just spectacular. So now you can, now we've taken away all the debris, the woody debris around it so that you can enjoy it. We've seen a lot of kids loving to climb on it and sit on it and it's, it's just stupendous. Um, and then, this section, as you know, um, backs onto the Canterbury Community Gardens and there's a, a fence there. So we just simply worked along the fence line. We tried to identify anything that was native and remove anything that was non-native. And um, unfortunately, most of this was native and also the forester came by and he noticed that a lot of the trees and shrubbery were interfering with the electrical lines and all it would really take was a few trees to come down and the neighborhood would probably um, Go dark. So we had a lot of teams working along this section. Once we cleared it out, the city donated uh, and dropped off some wood chips for us to lay down, and we purchased some native plants. Um, well, I'll show you the planting plant here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is uh, this is the cinder path, and this is Canterbury Road, and this is the community garden up here. So we planted a, a naturalistic hedge of um, Fragrant sumac, which is a beautiful native shrub that has a gorgeous leaf and turns a rusty color in the fall. And then we also planted some um, kind of on the uh, shaded side of the old of the oak tree. We planted flowering dogwood and redbud because we all love and just can't wait for all of our flowering um, trees to come into being. And in part, we were inspired by this vista. This tree is on Kingston Road. And as you walk 
um, east down the cinder path towards Kingston in the spring. And this will just be in another week or two. You see this beautiful flowering dogwood. And we, we imagine what the path might look like if we planted a lot of um, flowering dogwood and redwood. And another plant that we put in as a ground cover is golden ragwort, which will be, be blooming at the same time as these um, understory trees. But then when the yellow flowers, which are very early blooming, go away, then it, it's just a beautiful ground cover. Now, I know that the Bradford cinder path is not going to look like this woodland um, scenery, but Imagine as you're walking down the Bradford cinder path how beautiful it can be, not only with spring flowering trees, but also in the fall. So these are a couple of the trees. Uh, flowering dogwood has a beautiful white flower and in the fall it's a gorgeous red with red berries. And then um, the red bud has a beautiful heart-shaped yellow leaf that is also very attractive in the fall. So we're trying to not only um, create habitat for wildlife but for ourselves as well and to lift our spirits um, with some of these amazing plants. Oh this is a picture in the middle of the fragrant sumac shrub and we're combining it with a little bit of mountain mint which is a huge butterfly magnet. We've also planted some shrubby St. John's wort, this yellow flowering shrub that's very hardy and just will be a buzz with, um, with pollinators in June. So one of the, I just wanted to run by, run through, well, not even not run through, but really state emphatically that our intentions are to work with the neighbors. These paths, even though they're city property, are really part of the yards of the 14 homes that abut the cinder path. And some of the people who live along the cinder path, such as Blair Bain, uh, Blaine Bear, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> convoluted your name, have been mowing and caretaking their side of the path for 20 years so that we all care about these areas. So we want to work with the neighbors. We've actually hand delivered letters three times since we started the project in 2019 to all of the neighbors, informing them of our intentions, what we're doing and asking them to be involved. So one of our, like for example, in this picture, we planted some red buds and flowering dogwoods and we worked with the neighbors, Katie Daly and her partner, John, you know, where would you like these plants um, with these trees? And so we were able to plant a red bud that they'll be able to see outside their window. So we're, we're really trying to make the cinder path be part of the neighborhood and part of these um, people's homes and yards. Another goal is to reduce maintenance and mowing for the city by planting natives. Um, this whole area doesn't have to be mowed. You know, we could have just mowed um, strips for uh, we dog walkers. We're dog walkers. Our dog loves going down the cinder path and reading all the daily news. And so, but we, we can reduce the mowing and which would reduce our emissions and the work that the city has to do as well as improve habitat. So we have multiple goals and we want to be um, not imposing anything. We're all part of this neighborhood. We wanna work with everybody. So I wanted to announce that there will be a brainstorming meeting for the um, South Taylor to Queenston block of the cinder path on Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. at this site, weather permitting, meeting on the cinder path in this block. And um, Barbara Day, who lives on Bradford Road for decades, has offered to um, be the captain of this block. And um, she's inviting you all to come. We started a very small patch of pollinators there last year, and one of the goals, some of the goals of, for this year, to expand this pollinator garden, maybe take down the somewhat unsightly chicken wire fences protecting the plants from the deer, and um, use various upcycled materials to build a more artistically appealing fence. And really, the sky's the limit. You know, it's your input on native plants and pollinators, shrubs and trees that it's important here. And the neighbor who lives here, Carolyn Freer, has also opened up her backyard and says, oh, I don't garden in my backyard much anymore. If you'd like to garden in my backyard, let's, you know, let's make a plan. So we could create maybe a little woodlands or a forest there that would expand from her yard into the, into the cinder path. So here is Barbara Day's contact information information, her phone number, 
and her email here, or simply show up on Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. I wanted to thank so many people for helping us learn more about the Cinder Path, and believe me, we, have, we don't know everything. We just know what we've found out, and there might be many of you listening today who have more information than we do. But first, thank you to Carol Hamley, Kara Hamley O'Donnell, because when we first called her about, you know, where did these columns come from? She was the one that gave us access to all of these um, Cleveland Heights City Council minutes from the 1930s and the 1936. And John and I went down to City Hall and we just had a ball leafing through these books. I mean, you could spend the rest of your life just reading old City Council meeting minutes and finding out so much more about our city. And then thank you to Future Heights for approving and granting us $1,000, which we have spent for plans and fencing. And then our city staff has been so incredibly helpful. Um, they really look at, at us as partners in, um, in our city, and they're always so open to working with us. Joe McRae, Andre Spencer, Dan Krisner, and the crews who deliver um, um, wood chips or come by and ship up all of our debris. And then also to thank the city for enabling the stone column restoration and removing trees, shredding brush, et cetera. And Brian Wagner for his expertise in restoring the stone columns, all the neighborhood volunteers who removed and replaced invasive species with native ones, and Marion Morton, who actually now lives on Bradford Road, who has is our resident historian. I'm sure you've all read so many of the things that she's written about the history of different parts of Cleveland Heights. And if you visit um, the website of the Cleveland Heights Historical Society, or just go to your local bookstore, um, you'll find many books and pamphlets written by Marian. And we really appreciate her participation in, in everything we've been doing. So we would love for you to join us. Um, you can email Deb Frankie, who's the captain of the block between Princeton and Canterbury at friends.bradford.cinder.path at gmail.com. Future Heights will accept tax deductible donations on behalf of us to continue our work. We'd like to be able to buy some more trees and some more um, shrubs. And if you have missing history about this neighborhood that we haven't even touched on, about the royals, as they call Kingston, Queenston, Princeton, just contact um, Jessica here, Jessica Robinson. Her email is down below, and I'm sure you have it in chat as well, because she's um, in charge of our local history chapter at the Heights Library and is amassing lots of great stories and tales of our shared history. So again, thank you all for being here and listening to what we found out about the Bradford Cinder Path. There's a lot more to uncover, I'm sure, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you all for that wonderful talk. Um, I did see a couple of, there, there was at least one question. Um, and let me see if I can get the wording right. Um, uh, there was a, um, someone was wondering, could the new columns have replaced other original columns? Like when you were talking about some of them were built in the 1930s and then the others were built later, is that a possibility or no? Yes, it's very much a possibility. Uh, we think that the columns may have been the indicators for school children and others uh, to know where to cut through the blocks. Uh, when Cleveland Heights purchased um, some of the blocks to try to get there, um, to try to get Brad, uh, land for the Bradford Road extension all the way through, they weren't able to get uh, contiguous blocks for the cross streets. And so the path does jog back and forth a little bit. And the stone columns may have been there to say, you know, cut through here, cut through here, cut through here. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, our hypothesis is that yes, there were columns uh, everywhere, uh, but that over time they were lost and rebuilt in the 60s or 70s, we think. We'd love to get some more information from this if other people have it. Okay, yeah, there's a couple of others. Um, someone asks, uh, they say, I may have missed it, but why is it called Cinder? 
Good point. I mean, here we gave the whole history of the cinder path without mentioning that. Sure. Um, apparently, from what we read, it was a very muddy path. And um, they would lay cinders and gravel on it to um, reduce the mud so that, you know, everybody didn't get all yucky tra traversing it. Mm. Or so we're told. Okay. Um, I also have a question that says, uh, when they tore down the houses to build Canterbury in the 1920s, Weren't those most likely brand new houses? Were there any complaints? Uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't see that. Um, if somebody wants to go down to go through some of the um, archives, they might find out. They probably were pretty new houses, sure, because most of these houses here were built in the 20s. So, you know, I would guess probably yes. The history of the original, you know, the possibility that there was a different school building there for Canterbury School for a little while, or maybe a much smaller building um, exists. And we haven't yet been able to track down where there, was there an original building and then a new building put up after that? And at what point did the community garden become a community garden? Because we'd love to know that history. And we think it was, or know it was a World War II victory garden. Victory garden. But mm -hmm. how long it had been there before World War II? So lots of unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another question. Um, will a donation to Future Heights with a designation to the Cinder Path Group make sure 100% of the money will go to this effort? Um, I see that Deanna Remmer Fisher's on this, um, and she said that Future Heights receives a small administrative fee from each donation in order to cover administration, reporting, and mailing acknowledgement to the donors. So not quite 100%, but I think it's a pretty small percentage. Okay. Um, and then there's... Hmm. This, this may, that may have, sorry, I, I, I think what I'm looking at may have just been a comment that was directed to somebody else. Maybe. Um, Peggy? Yes? Uh, this is Deanna Hi. Uh, on the uh, Kingston Road corner. And I noticed that um, through all this, you've called the um, stone uh, markers, uh, uh, stone markers as opposed to bollards. And that's what I was always calling them. Ooh. And if you look up the definition of bollard, the British definition is one of a series of short posts for excluding or diverting motor vehicles from a road, lawn, or the like. And I think that's what these were originally uh, designed for. Wonderful. That's great information to know. Absolutely. Thank you, Deanna. I've, I've lived here for 40 some years and I guess I've always called them bollards. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just surprised that isn't a, a, a commonly used uh, title for them. But anyway, I wanted to share that with you tonight. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. great information to have. Thank you, Deanna. I think there's one other one down here. Um, it says, I had heard once the reason the blocks are so wide is there was an intention to put streets from Fairmount to East Scarborough through the blocks of Queenston to Kingston, Kingston to Princeton, and Princeton to Canterbury. Any idea if this is true? You know, one of the things, uh, several people, there's a lot of theories about why our yards on these streets are so deep. And um, when I look, if you go to um, the maps, there's this wonderful website Hold on a second, let me just get back to that website. Such patience you all have, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, there's a website called Cleveland Historic Maps. It's a www.arcgis.com. And if you go to that website, you can look at maps that are layered on top of other laps, maps. So that's where we got these maps. So you can see maps from 1852, 1858, 19. So you, that's how we found this progression. And if you look at the maps, 
you know, all of these um, plots were laid out um, just as they are today, pretty much. So I don't know if there were ever any plans. I mean, one theory is that there was um, plans to build, you know, alleys behind the houses. When I lived on Kingston, I was told that they left these deep yards so that the farmers could continue to farm behind the houses along these long strips. I have no idea, but the maps don't really give any indication of anything other than the lots being laid out the way they are. Maybe there was some kind of zoning codes early on that could be looked up in the zoning department. I don't know, but it's a really, it's a good question. Yeah, I do also see a participant with a hand up. I don't know if she wants to ask a question. Um. Hi there, Kristen here. Hi, Deanna, it's your neighbor across the path from you. <laughs> um, I am curious, so I was on Nextdoor. I've had my house for about three years and um, I haven't gotten involved. I must say, I don't recall getting a letter, frankly, but I'm very excited about this. And uh, it, it, frankly, living along the cinder path, when I bought the house three years ago, that was the big feature for me to buy that house. I love it. But I am curious on Nextdoor, uh, that app for neighbors, we were all chatting about why the backyards are so soggy. And someone had, uh, I think he discovered that uh, on a map back when it was called the Bradford Laterals, that there is perhaps an underground stream underneath the cinder path. So I'm curious what you guys know about that. Well, um, first of all, apologies if, that you didn't get a letter. We only oh, sent letters okay. to the 14 houses that were adjacent to the path. That's um, me. That's yeah. me. I'm directly across from Deanna. I'm right on the path. Oh. I'm on Kingston. Well, I'm really surprised then you did it. Frankly, why. you have my garage in about three of your slides. It's very oh. exciting. Okay. And, a, and a nice garage it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But anyhow, let's go back to this 1858 uh, map because one of the things we forgot to mention here is you see this wavy line. Well, that's Meadow Brook, right? And then the one down below here, that's the Doan Brook. Now, we don't have any indication on these maps whether there were any ancillary um, streams or rivulets or anything like that. But I wouldn't be surprised given the topography of our of Cleveland Heights if, you know, that there weren't some. And as we know, most of the streams, including Meadowbrook, obviously, were completely culvertized um, for development. So it would not be surprising to me. We, we live on Bradford up near, you know, between Lee and Taylor. Our backyard just goes straight down and we have a wetland down there. So we also postulate that there were some streams that were connected to each other. Because imagine what this used to look like um, before, before the farming even. It was all wooded, there were probably streams and ravines and you know, looking a little bit like the Metro Parks probably. Well, it's very exciting to think about. It got me into looking at um, something called daylighting, which is where they're you know, little by little bringing the streams back up. Amen. And uh, just the thought of what that could be like as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I have two other questions. Do we have, we, you, you have time to answer them? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I don't know. We got to be somewhere. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Um, <laughs> I have a question about Brian and his column work. Um, if he donated his time or if there was a combination of, um, uh, yeah, was he paid for the column work or did he donate his time or a combination? Um, he was paid for his time. Um, we didn't even ask him for a donation because it didn't seem appropriate. I mean, people who do handwork are so often, as we know, artists, et cetera, et cetera, are asked to donate time. And his time and his talent and his expertise is very valuable. Um, so no, we didn't ask him to donate his time and he was paid in full. It was, how much was it? Seven? It was about $7,000. And um, if those of you who watched him work, 
you know, the care and the chiseling and everything. It was, it was really a beautiful process to watch a craftsman at work in a, in a pretty much lost, um, a lost art. Yeah, I see one other question, but I think this was answered in the chat. So I don't know if anyone else has anything else they want to send to the chat box. I think we got all of the questions, but if I missed it, um, if you would um, resend it, because I think most of the other ones were answered in the chat. So I don't think they necessarily need to be. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Um, you um, you mentioned uh, an email, right? That people could reach out to you at, right? In the uh, we didn't actually mention our email, <laughs> but um, if you wanted to connect with, um, I should put back. I'm sorry, the the last slides. But I mean, absolutely. Um, my email is Peggy Spath. My last name is spelled S P A E T H at gmail.com. And um, John's is um, jcbarber27 at gmail.com. So you can connect with either, you know, Barb Day or um, Deb Frank or one of us. We're all pretty easy to find around town. All and right. thank you. It's so good to see so many familiar faces from my you know 40 30 years whatever on kingston and 40 years in cleveland heights so thank you all friends old and new for coming and thanks to friends of bradford cinderpath because you're an awesome group of people someone did ask if the presentation slides are available for review on the lecture i can, itself, I can, I can make a pdf of them if you like and then um, send it to you jessica Okay, yeah, if any, if you uh, would like the presentation slides, um, email uh, me at localhistory at heightslibrary.org um, and Peggy will send them to me and then I can uh, forward them to anyone who is interested or if you have any other questions. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. This was wonderful. Thank you, Peggy and John. This was we had fantastic, fun. a fantastic presentation. There's a lot of thank yous coming through the chat. Um, and uh, I'll remind everyone just one last time that it's being recorded. Um, so you can check out the YouTube channel for the Cleveland, it's the Cleveland Heights Historical YouTube channel if you want to watch it again or share it with your friends. Thank you. Thanks for listening, guys. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Have a nice night, everyone.